purpose of the book is found in chapter 2 and verse number 1, and that is that we may not sin. I'll read verse 1 and 2 tonight and share some thoughts with you and trust the Lord may help us with some thoughts tonight. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So you see, once again, he's showing that Jesus is the mediator between God and man, an advocate, one called alongside to assist us in an aid. Look at verse 2. And he is the propitiation. What does that word propitiation mean? Does anybody want to take a shot at it before I give it to you? Atonement. The word uh, propitiation there in the context, it means atonement. Now what is the atonement? Does anybody know what is involved in the atonement? Alright, I guess that's why I'm the preacher. The blood is involved in the atonement. The death of Christ is involved in the atonement. And God being satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ is all a part of the atonement. Now, what does it mean to be atoned for? That means that the blood of Jesus was placed instead for your sin and my sin to hold back the wrath of God on us. Therefore, the wrath of God was put on Him. That's the atonement. The atonement is His blood being sufficient to atone for our sin. That's what propitiation means. So He's sharing with this group of people who the Savior really is. Now, if they had known who the Savior really was, then why does it seem like He's revealing that to them as who the atonement is for their sin? So, he, let's read on. He says that He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, the purpose of the writing of this book, a threefold or a third purpose is that we sin not. In verse 1, he says, These things write I unto you that you sin not. Now, I'm going to pull it down and apply this tonight to our life as believers. And I believe still in the context, though, he's still trying to evangelize unbelievers. But I think it also speaks volumes to us tonight because all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. But if you're looking for a correct interpretation, that's why I tried to share with you why I thought it was written to evangelize unbelievers. But there is an application here that you and I can apply to our life as well. And if I had a subtitle to put on this third part, it's easier said than done, is what I would call it. Because when he said, these things have I written unto you that you sin not. I think we'd all have to agree that that is easier said than done. Would you agree with me on that? I think we all find it easier to say, I'm not going to do it than to not do it. It's easier to say, I'm going to say no than to really say no. It's kind of like, I'm really wanting to drop a few pounds. I'm trying to so I can switch my insurance and save the church some money on my health insurance. I need to drop about 25 pounds to really save the church a lot of money. So I'm trying to drop some weight. I'm not being very effective at that yet, but I'm trying. Can I get an A for effort? I mean, I really want to try to lose some weight uh, for that reason. And, that, and of course, health reasons as well. But last week when we had revival with Brother Ken and Jubilee, we had supper every night. And we all know the worst time to eat a meal is right before bedtime. But when you've got a bunch of preachers, we do not want to eat right before we preach. Amen. It is hard to preach on a full stomach. You, it'll cause you all kinds of grief and pain and torment. My wife thinks supper tonight right before we come to church. I said, I'll eat when I get home. 
And uh, But the other night, I was thinking, okay, I'm trying to do good, I'm trying to do good, I'm trying to do good. I need to drink water, water, water. And there was Nanner Pudding and, and Peggy Kerr, and she ain't here tonight. She made a chocolate delight one night. Y'all done so great. Everybody did, and I'm trying to brag on you, not because I just want to brag on you, but I really mean it. I mean, the food was awesome. I'd look over at that man or put, and I was like, I don't need none of that. I don't need none of that. And I was determined in my mind before I come to church, I ain't eating nothing much after church, and I ain't eating no sweets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I done predetermined in my mind. I wasn't eating no man or pudding, and I wasn't going to eat whatever they had there that would really, in other words, if it tastes good when you're on a diet, you're supposed to spit it out. And, uh, but when I got here, you know what I done? Lo and behold, I indulged. It was easier for me to say no to it at home than it was to really fulfill the act of not eating it. And that's the way sin is to our life. We can sit back and say, I ain't going to do that. I ain't going to touch that. But when the opportunity arises, it's easier said than done. I have always said two things. When they get together, look out, you're getting ready to get in trouble if you ain't careful. When temptation meets opportunity, you're fixing to have a problem. Amen. Yeah. Let me say that again. When temptation and opportunity have a greeting, you're fixing to mess up. The best way to deal with it, we're all tempted so we know we can't get away from the temptation. But we can stop the opportunity. See, a lot of times if we won't put ourselves in the position to where we will be tempted, then we're a whole lot better off. But when that opportunity we know is over here and we're already tempted, if we deliberately go toward that opportunity, we're just asking for trouble. Because chances are, you ain't going to be able to say no. Amen. Boy, it's quiet now. You know I'm telling you the truth. There's two things you need to be careful of. We all do in our life. That's why when I go to another man's house or another family's house to visit or whatever, if the woman is just there by herself, I don't go in. I don't. Am I tempted with another woman? No, I'm not. But I do know every man is tempted. And every woman too. It's not just men that are tempted toward the opposite sex. And so you're better off to never let the opportunity meet with your temptation, whether regardless of what it is. Stay away from the opportunity. The temptation is always going to be there. We're all going to wrestle with it till the day we die. But I can keep myself from getting in trouble by staying away from opportunity. Am I making any sense tonight at all? I know I've kind of slowed it down a little bit for all of us tonight, but I'm hoping the Lord will try to help us maybe learn a little something about our Christian life and our walk. It is easier said than done. So temptation and opportunity, they both are bad, bad things when you get them together. It causes problems. Let's look into our, our message tonight. I want to share with you three things about this, it being easier said than done. And I'm going to stay here in the context of these two verses, and may the Lord help us tonight. I've already dealt a little bit with the first verse, or the first, the first point, and that is, there's a problem we all must admit. He says in here, in verse 1, He says, I write unto you that ye sin not. That is a problem that we all must admit. Amen. Does anybody in here find it hard not to sin? If so, raise your hand. How many in here tonight find it easier to sin than not to sin? Raise your hand. Everybody in here. So we've all admitted tonight we've got a problem. Amen. And it's a mutual problem. Glory to God, a Baptist church voted 100% that we've all got a problem. That is unbelievable and unreal. A problem we all must admit. Okay, now, why is it such a problem to not sin? Why is it so hard? Well, 
the first point. We could say one reason why it's so easy to sin is because our fallen nature and our flesh loves it. We love it. I mentioned some of this Sunday morning dealing with my message, but our fallen nature loves sin. We've got two people living inside of us. We've got a natural man and a spiritual man. We've got a carnal man and a godly man. And these two's got to share the same room together and they don't get along. One's leaving trash out and clothes thrown everywhere and the other one's trying to come behind him and clean things up. And so there's a conflict going all the time. I've said this before and I I'll say it again. I would to God I could kick one of the roommates out. <laughs> but God so designed it that we live that way in this life. That's where the war comes in your members and in mine. Paul even said, I go to do good and evil's present. I go to do evil and good is present. And that that I shouldn't do, I don't do. And that that I shouldn't do, I do. So he's saying in effect, it's easier said than done. That's what he said. Why? Our flesh. He even went on in verse 17 of Romans chapter number 7. There are six. I can't remember. I think it's seven. Where he said, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he said, Oh sinful man that I am. And so he even saw himself that his flesh loved sin and craved sin and desired sin. That's why it's important, listen, Bethel, to be faithful. It's so important to be faithful to God's house. It's so important to be faithful reading your Bible. It's so important to be faithful to Sunday school and fellowshipping with God's people and revival. Why? That will cause your spiritual man to outgrow your carnal man in your world. And sooner or later your spiritual man will gain victory over your natural man. And then you can live your Christian life in victory. Sometimes it's hard. It's easier said than done. That problem, we all must admit it's a problem because our flesh loves it. Number two, it's hard to keep from sinning, especially when we're drifting from the Lord. That's why it makes it hard. I just mentioned some of that. The further we drift away from God in our daily life, whether, you know, sometimes we go to work and and there's old Hank and Willie and Waylon. And boy, they're going at it. And you're reminiscing about days gone by. Man, having a good time, patting your foot, rolling the window down. And uh, there you are. What is that doing? That's feeding the natural man. Or you may be, you know, uh, the, I ain't got time and I can't read my Bible or do a devotion or spend any time fellowshipping with Him, just in communion, thinking about Him, talking to Him. And what that does, that causes us to eventually drift further and further and further away from the Lord. And the further we drift away from the Lord, the easier it is to do things we know is not right. It's kind of like me when I was a kid growing up at home. I knew if I was close to my daddy, if I'd done it, here I am on Hitler again, ain't that something? I knew if I'd done something wrong, I was going to get my hind end tore up or a thump in the back of the head. But if I could get away from my daddy, just like the prodigal son, that's what was in the back of his mind. If I can just get away from my daddy. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And that's exactly what we all do spiritually in our life. Because I knew I couldn't do what I wanted to do, which was bad sometimes in front of my daddy. I would be in serious trouble. So it is in the life of the believer. The further we drift away from God and the spiritual things of life, then the easier it is to live a sinful lifestyle and fall into sin. And then when we fall into sin, we lose our victory, we lose our joy, we lose our fellowship, we lose our right frame of mindset, we get a bad spirit about us, and we turn into a bad person that we don't even like. But if we can stay away from sin and walk in victory and walk in the newness of life, it's a whole lot more enjoyable. Amen. What's another reason why we have so easier, it's so hard to keep from sin? Here's another one. Because uh, we don't think about the consequences. That's why we have such a problem. You know, we don't think about, and I mentioned, I know this is rehashing a lot of what I do with Sunday morning. I can't help it. I started this series three or four or five weeks ago, and so here we are again. We don't think about the consequences. 
you know, you, you, you don't think about getting caught. You think, you think okay, we're not going to get caught this time. But sooner or later we do. What's another reason? Another, another reason why it's hard to, hard to keep from sinning is when nobody's looking. When there ain't none of my friends or my family or nobody around, it's easy to sin. Nobody but me by myself. And it's at those times we don't even think about God seeing everything that we do. We think that we're doing it. Nobody is looking. So therefore we do it behind closed doors. Another reason why we find it hard to keep from sinning, or others may find it hard to keep from sinning, is just simply because they ain't saved at all. They can't stop themselves. You see, a natural man cannot discern the things of God Amen. or understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Amen. So he has no power to control his flesh other than his own will. And the will of man cannot withstand the pressure of temptation. The will of man will eventually cave in. Yes. And you and I, when we rely on our own self-will to avoid and turn away from temptation, guess what? We cave in as well. But those that are born again, we have an advocate. We have a third person of the Trinity that is living inside us. And you and I have the power in us to say no to sin as we trust Him to be our own strength. Amen. As we repeat what, what, what Paul said in Philippians 4.13 where he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 1 John 4.4 4, Greater is He that's in me than he that is in the world. And the only way a child of God is able to abstain from the sinful lust of this life is to rely on the third person that being the Holy Ghost and to grow in your relationship with Him. The problem we all must admit. So you say, well, people's crazy today. Why do people do crazy things like they do today? Because they don't know Jesus. They've never been born again. That's the problem. Not only I want us to see there's a problem we all must admit, but I want us to notice a person we all can approach. Look at verse 1 again. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. There's a problem. We've all admitted that. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Here he is, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he's defined who he is. In other words, we can approach Christ with our sin. What a wonderful thing. Why is it? Why is it so wonderful that we have a person that we can approach? Number one, because He can hear our prayer. He can hear us call on His name. Watch this. I dealt with the propitiation a while ago and I'm going to deal with it a little bit more right now. Watch this. Propitiation or Jesus being our propitiation does not mean that everybody is reconciled to God. The word reconciled means made friends with God. No longer an enemy to God, but now you're made friends with God. Some people look at that and say, well, everybody's sins has been covered. Everybody's going to heaven. Uh-uh, uh-uh. This man that we can approach who is Jesus made propitiation and the blood made propitiation possible for all of us. But it does not make it active for everybody. And it does not lessen the fact or the magnitude of the sin that's been committed. It just means that there's a payment being paid for that sin. And that's what makes it so wonderful when you know you've messed up and you've done something wrong or you've fallen out in sin and maybe the devil caught you by surprise. Or maybe you blatantly knew what you was getting into and you indulged it in any way, not realizing all the damage it was going to cause. What makes this propitiation so wonderful is the fact that Jesus being our propitiation and His atonement and His blood that made it all worthwhile. We can go to Him with our sin and give forgiveness of our sin. And if you've been born again, you are forgiven of your sin. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
Now, when you really get out and do something bad and sin in your life, and it, by the way, it's not just bad sins that He died for. It's all sin in the eyes of God. We're the ones that categorize sin. We put them in order. Yeah. Like uh, child molestation would be number one, probably in my book. Yeah. And then you got adultery. And then you come on down and you got murder. And then you come on down, which they're all right in there together. And we never really throw in lying. That's not real bad. Because we're all pretty good at it. I used to be a pro at it. If you don't believe it, I was so good at lying, I could tell a lie and make my own self believe it. I was. Anybody else in here ever get a lie? Am I the only one that's ever really honest? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your nose is growing, Don. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, and, and we don't we don't throw these small ones in there that we've seen look at as really not mean nothing. It really a bad thought or a bad deed, uh, doing somebody dirty and knowing you're doing them dirty. Here a while back, I went to the store and I got a drink. I gave a woman a ten dollar bill. Well, when I left, she gave me a twenty in return. Well, she didn't think nothing about it. She was so busy. I grabbed that 20 and I looked and I said, well, what did I give that woman? And I went back and here's what I could have done. I could have shoved that 20 in my pocket and said, boy, it paid for me to go to the store today. <laughs> but I didn't. I turned right back around. I went to the store and I said, ma'am, you didn't do this right. She said, what do you mean? She didn't know what she'd done. I could have took advantage of her right there. But my conscience would have beat me to yeah. death. Yeah, you're right. So I go back in there and I said, ma'am, I gave you a $10 bill I'm trying to pay for this drink and you gave me a 20 in return and I walked out the door. I've come back in to pay for my drink and you need to take this $20 bill back. Why? My conscience means a whole lot to me. Yeah. When I pillow my head down at night, I want to have peace in my little bitty heart yeah. and I want to have a clear conscience up here in my mind yeah. that everything's all right between yeah. here and yonder. Yeah. You know how bad it is to go to bed and you and your wife or husband been arguing? That ain't fun. It ain't no fun when your conscience is sitting there screaming in your ear trying to tell you what you've done was wrong. That ain't no fun. Amen. And when you do something wrong, you know how it is. You don't really want nobody to know when you do something wrong. We don't mind telling everybody when we do something good, do we? We like to talk about that. The good things. I mean, hey, who don't like? Sometimes you got to toot your own horn because if you don't, nobody else will. Now, I'm not talking about going around bragging all the time. I mean, you don't need to do that. Sometimes it's all right to toot your own little horn a little bit. But when it's something bad... And by the way, you better be careful who you tell some of the bad things in your life to. Not everybody is a good ear to listen to you. Amen. Some people's going to pass judgment on you even though you think they're not. They're going to look at you and say, Oh my Lord, I can't believe that. And when somebody, and when you tell them, look, please don't tell nobody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That right there is just the fence and the hit. And they might keep it for a while, but sooner or later, they'll let it slip. Or they might go to a friend. I told them I wasn't going to say nothing about it, but you're real close to me, and I want you to oh, help yeah. me pray about this oh, person. Yeah. Yeah. And we really need to be praying for them. And that whole time you're enjoying telling this little gossip story, and you're doing wrong automatically, and the other person is sitting there foaming at the mouth like, yes, tell me something bad, because that's making me feel good about what's bad in my life. And so they sat there and they said, now look, don't you tell anybody. I told them I wouldn't tell a soul. So if you tell anybody, we're both in trouble. Yeah. And then before long, it goes on and on and on. And before long, instead of somebody buying a new dog, they done bought a brand new lake house and a yacht and everything else. Did y'all hear what happened? Time it goes from one person through all these different other years, this changed stories. Matter of fact, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago here at Bethel, on a Sunday morning, I started a rumor on the back road and had a whisper in that thing. How many of y'all was here back then? I, I done forgot what I told them, but I started it back there in the back and I said, whisper it one time and somebody's here in front of you and I wanted it to come all the way to the front row and then I had somebody tell me what my secret was. It was so far off base. It had not, It wasn't even nowhere near what I actually said to the person. And so, a lot of times we don't want to share, and you better be careful who you share things in your life with. But it'd be good to know we can go to the Lord in prayer, in confidence, knowing it ain't going no further. And you'll be telling you what happens when you go to Jesus in 
prayer or you tell him about your problems. You don't have to worry about it not going any further, that's for sure. But you can never talk to a friend and share your burden and clear your conscience. Friend, you share it with Him. And Jesus is the only one that can clear your conscience and clear your slate and give you peace of mind that everything's going to be alright. Why is all of that possible? Why are we able to have peace in our heart? It's simply because of the power in the blood of Jesus that's still there. Somebody says there's no power in the blood, they're crazy. If there's no power in the blood, then we'd all be carrying around the guilt of everything yeah. bad yeah. we'd ever done in our life. Somebody says, I don't believe in the... I'm about to preach in a minute. Yeah. I don't believe in the power of the blood. Well, friend, you've never been born again yeah. and ever felt the power of God take away your sin and the conscience of ever doing anything wrong. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. There's wonder working power in the blood. hear our prayer and he ain't going to tell nobody about it. He can handle your problem. He's our advocate. I mean, he not only will hear you, but he'll give you good advice to take care of it and he can deal with it properly. You know, I think a lot of times we look for advice from other people and counseling, and I don't do as much as I have in years gone by, please don't take that as a sign that I want to counsel. <laughs> No, I don't like it. I will if I have to. It comes along with the territory, but I don't like it. A lot of times people really don't want to hear what you've got to say anyway when you're talking to them or they want to come talk to you. They just want somebody they can tell or talk to. And I found out that some of the best counseling I've ever done in my life, and I have done some good counseling, Matter of fact, in Bible college, and not many people know about that, and I don't say it much, I did study psychology. And you want me to tell you some of the best counseling I've ever done? Is when I didn't say a thing. Didn't say a word. That's some of the best counseling you can do, is just let somebody listen. But a lot of times, if you ain't careful, somebody come to you with a problem, like I just say, if a woman's having trouble with her husband, and she says, I need to talk to you, and I need to confide in you. You're sitting over here all by yourself. We're men. I ain't like a woman, all right? <laughs> I just don't know, Matthew, what I'm going to do about my wife. I, I'm telling you, I'm so upset, and I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Can you give me some good advice and, and help me out? And you, you ain't even married, though, are you? You ain't got no other problems, have you? Well, I don't either, but I'm trying to act like I do. And so you talk to somebody about your problems, and if you're not careful, that person is going to get upset and mad. Are they doing you like that? Well, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd pack my bags up. I'd be gone by morning. Or I'd pack his clothes up in the back and throw them out in the front yard. And before you know it, you're like, yeah, you know what? She's right. Yeah, he, he's telling me the truth. I don't deserve this. I deserve better. Now, I'll tell you what we all deserve. We all deserve hell. That's what we all, all of us really deserve. And if you're not careful, you'll take that advice and listen to somebody else trying to handle your problem when there's only one counselor that'll give you the right medication and the right advice every time. And his name is Jesus. Wonderful advocate that we have. What a person we can approach. Amen. He can heal your pain too. You know what? The pain of committing sin is horrible. It's gut-wrenching. And sometimes it takes a long time for the wound to ever begin to heal. Yes, sir. I've seen some people that are still trying to heal. Had things happened years ago. And because of one bad decision, it caused a wound and it took time. But I'll tell you right now, He can heal it, friend. Amen. He can heal it. Somebody asked me one time, says, well, preacher, it's been so long ago. Why am I still hurting? Let me tell you why I think God allows us to hurt sometimes a long time when we get into something mess up. It's just to remind us so we'll never do it again. Amen. <coughs> 
So we'll see just how bad it really is. I mean, he could take it away just like that if he wanted to. I mean, he could remove it. Everything, God. And I think sometimes that's what we want. We want to be able to go out here and mess up and do something or say something and our conscience all of a sudden be clean. And it could be. But God says, I'm going to let you wear that a while. I'm going to let you tote that around. So you remember just how hard it was. Let me give you my last point and I'm going to let you all go. Watch your <coughs> We've seen, first of all, the problem we all must admit, the person we all can approach. But now I want you to notice this, the promise we all can attain. Look at verse 2. It says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's the promise. He is the propitiation for our sins. Three things, four things. Notice, first of all, the now of this propitiation. It says in verse 2, He is the propitiation. In other words, that was not only effective then, but it's effective now. The now. And I'm glad the atonement for sin is just as much now as it ever was then. Thank God when a person messes up, I'm glad we've got a promise that He is His atonement, His blood. The now. The now of this propitiation. My, my. Notice secondly of all the necessity of this propitiation. Look at verse 2 again. And He is the propitiation for our sins. Now remember what I said involved is involved in the propitiation. May, is the atonement. It's the blood of Jesus is the atonement. Right? Yeah. Are y'all with me? Amen. Why is the atonement so let time out. Let me remind all of us in here tonight why well, God ain't killed us all. Brother Ron, do we remember why God ain't killed every single one of us in here? We get on our high horse and la di da this and la di da that. And the only reason we're still alive tonight, it's not because we go to church. No, that's good. It's not because of any of that. It's the blood of Jesus has a call. Propitiation means He took your place, my place, the wrath of God abided on Him. Amen. That's why yes, we're not consumed. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why propitiation and atonement is so necessary. It's a necessity. Without it, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So in the eyes of God, God hated sin so bad, and He still does. But His wrath on sin was taken care of through the blood of Jesus at Calvary. He poured all of His wrath out on it. For yours and mine, big and small, it don't matter. He put it all on Him right there. That's why it's so necessary. And either a person accepts by faith Jesus as propitiation or propitiator for their sin or they pay for them themselves. That's why it's so necessary. Necessary. So he would say, well, the atonement don't mean nothing to me. That's why you're living. The blood of Jesus. Now, this crowd now taking the blood of Jesus out of books and yeah. Bibles and, yeah. and all this, they're taking away the power, man. When you take away the blood and the atonement and, and all of that that satisfied God for the wrath of Him was poured out, setting you and I free. And thanks be to God, you and I live tonight because of the blood of Jesus. You can pillow your head this evening because of the blood. You'll get up in the morning with joy in your heart and in your soul because of the blood. Amen. Amen. The necessity of this propitiation, the now of this propitiation, as promised. But I want you to notice the number of this propitiation. Verse 2 again, also for the sins of the whole world. That means in one aspect, 
that the atonement can cover anybody and everybody that's ever been born on the face of this earth. There will never be anybody that will ever say, I trusted you as my Savior and I needed atonement for my sin and I, you would not forgive me. Never. Never. What that is saying is showing you a broad aspect of the abundance of the blood and the power of the blood. It's not just good enough for one, two, three, four, five, or ten, but it's good for everybody on the face of the world. Anybody that needs forgiveness of their sin, if they'll come to Him by faith, He's the propitiation, not for ours only, but the sin of the whole world. Amen. And I'm glad it's without number. Let me give you this fourth one. The neglect of this propitiation. The promise that we have. The fact that atonement and propitiation. I hope I ain't been over your head with these words. Have I explained them enough where we yes. understand it? Yes. Sometimes I get carried away with them and I want y'all to understand what I'm saying. The neglect of this propitiation. That word propitiation as I said a while ago, and this promise does not make it active in the life of a person until they accept it. Let me say that again. A person in their sin, just because we've all been given a promise, I'm talking about unbelievers, it does not make their blood of Jesus Christ effective in that person's life until they receive it. Amen. Yes. Amen. We have a promise that it's there. But it's up to the individual person who is convicted of their sin, drawn by the Spirit, and see themselves in need of a Savior. And through faith they receive it. Yeah. That is the process of the promise of the propitiation for all of our sin. My, my. And not ours only, but the sin of the whole world. Now here's something I was thinking about today in my study when I was in there writing down things and praying. I was thinking, you know, the next time Brother Jojo, Brother Joseph, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call you Jojo in public. But Brother Jojo, <laughs> the next time I get ready to sin, or I'm tempted, and some say, you mean you get? Yeah. And if you don't, you're right. I need to think about what Jesus went through for me to do that and make it through it. Jesus paid a price. Yes, He did. And a lot of people neglect it as our propitiation. And here's the sad part. There's a lot of people that will reject Christ and Him being sufficient to atone for their sin. And they'll go about their own life to their own destruction. And they will one day pay for their own. It's easier said yeah. than done. Yes. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Daddy told me a story or made this statement to me. I think it was right after I got married. I'm going to say this. I ain't never told my wife this. I'm going to tell it. Daddy may not remember telling me, but I remember. And then again, he probably will because Daddy don't forget much. I remember Daddy telling me this. He said, son, you've got a good woman. He said, I believe y'all love each other and I'm glad you married her. Amen. He said, but and y'all making it fine. And we'd done been married five, six, seven years when he told me this. He said, but I'm getting ready to tell you something. If you make it in your marriage, it'll only be by the grace of God. Yes. Yep. That's it. Let me tell you why. It's easier to say you won't than it is not good. 
I'm done tonight. Let's stand there our feet. Lord, we love you. Thank you for our time together this evening. Lord, take these few scattered thoughts, Lord, that you've shared with me. And Lord, I pray that enlighten all of us. And Lord, help us through the rest of the week. Looking forward to Sunday. Can't wait to get back. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me share a couple things with you. And we're going